Well, good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar series, Black Lives with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and their Faith Communities. This is a discussion of the role of church communities in their lives of Black and Brown people with IDD, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and their families. This webinar is brought to you today by AAIDD's Religion and Spirituality Interest Network and the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Hall and I will be your moderator today. I am a researcher at the University of Minnesota and I'm the current chair of the Religion and Spirituality Interest Network. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to you in the future on our website. And the PowerPoint as well will be available on the AAIDD Religion and Spirituality Interest Network's website. Next. Now throughout the webinar, your microphone will be muted. So please use the chat liberally. Please enter any comments you have any questions, anything you would like to share to the discussion, you are welcome to enter that into the chat. My colleague, Chet Cheddar from the University of Minnesota will be monitoring the chat throughout the session. And so please feel free to, to put your questions in there at any time and we'll have a conversation. We'll talk about, um, our speakers will talk about their different topics, bounce off of that, but we will also be watching for those questions to make sure we insert those. Closed captioning is available. Um, you can turn the subtitles on and off by clicking on the live transcript function at the bottom. You have the option to either show subtitles and if you change your mind, you can hide subtitles later. And you may also click on the show full transcript to see the running transcript on the side. Next. So I'd like to introduce you a little to our interest network we are an interfaith interdisciplinary association. Um, we, of course, advocate for the inclusion of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the faith co communities of their choice. Um, the members, we have access to the Journal of Disability and Religion. That's, that's a strong benefit, have membership in the interest network. We also have a lot of activities we do throughout the year. We have events at the AIDD annual meeting. And even this year at the virtual meeting, we will be holding a lot of different events there. Um, we have the Henry Nolan Award, which we award at the annual meeting. And of course we have webinars and you might get more information from our website, Facebook, or Twitter. Next. So today we will be focusing on the history of the black church and its relationship with disability and building on to that, look at practical applications for moving forward. And then also looking at the impact of COVID-19 and how it's impacted including people with disabilities in the church. So I will now turn it over to Deborah Fisher to do, introduce our speakers. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us for this last fourth uh, in our webinar series. Uh, we are delighted to have this opportunity to um, have the conversation continue with our three panelists who will uh, each address some of the issues associated with um, the history of the Black Church, um, practical applications and specific issues as they pertain to COVID-19 as Sarah um, just described. Uh, our speakers are D Dr. Lamar Hardwick. Uh, he is an author and lead pastor at Tri-Cities Church in East Point, Georgia. Uh, Reverend Dr. Latanya Penny, who is the senior pastor of New Mountain Zion Baptist Church and executive director of Family Abuse Services. And Dr. Luchara Wallace, associate professor of special education and director of the Lewis Walker Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations at Western Michigan University. Uh, I don't want to spend any more time introducing you. I will let them um, start. I believe uh, Dr. Hardwick will begin. 
Well, thank you, uh, David, my um, colleagues. We thought it would be great to sort of wrap up this four-part series with uh, starting with talking a, a little bit of history since we're talking about uh, the Black church and its relationship to individuals um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I, I'd like to start with, um, you know, acknowledging that we're in Black History Month, which is great. Um, and, you know, most of the time that we are in Black History Month, the most, the most prominent names among many uh, that will come up is the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> now, a lot of people uh, have listened to his speeches. Um, but I want to encourage our, our viewers and our listeners to listen to perhaps one of his most, um, at least one of my most famous or most um, famous sermons that I enjoy, which is called uh, Guidelines for a Constructive Church. In that sermon in 1966, uh, June 5th, and I remember that because June 5th is my birthday, uh, Dr. King uh, preaches this sermon at his church. Uh, and in the opening of that sermon, uh, he talks about the fact that 12 years prior to that, so 1954, uh, it was ruled unconstitutional for uh, segregation of schools. Um, but somehow by 1966, um, he was reporting in the opening of the sermon that only about a 5.6% of all African-American students had been successfully integrated into uh, the school system after a Supreme Court decision that already ruled that that was unconstitutional. And what's fascinating about that sermon is that he reports that at that rate, um, it would take about 90 plus years um, for justice to be served. And so he sort of sets the stage um, for helping us understand what is the actual speed and pace of justice, of equality, uh, and in this particular case, an in integration. And, and then he goes on to preach the sermon and lays out powerful points that is important for uh, particularly the African-American church as he's preaching to his congregation uh, to be conduits and to have a prophetic voice uh, in our country uh, about advancing the cause of justice and tearing down the walls uh, that were dividing um, African Americans and and whites. And so, one of the most interesting parts of that sermon is that he makes a point that has always stuck out with me. He begins to talk about the fact that the church's role, um, and not just the uh, historically African American church, but um, speaking to his congregation from that context, he shares that while we had become successful in relieving the bonds of slavery and the bondage uh, of slavery itself, we still have an ob a moral obligation uh, and imperative to be a prophetic voice to uh, our nation to relieve the bondage that slavery had created. And that bondage was bias. Uh, so his point was, is that it wasn't just enough to free enslaved Africans, but there was a bias about black and, black and brown bodies that was created uh, because of the system of racism and segregation. And uh, that's important because, I, and I've mentioned this before, um, as we move into looking at how that impacts us currently, we can still see um, some of the residue of the bias that was created because of uh, ra racial segregation uh, and slavery that still exists, so much so, uh, even if we look at the data recently of diagnostic disparities uh, in autism, the, the number, the gap has thankfully been closing rapidly between um, African-American and Latino children being diagnosed at the same rates as white children. However, um, according to the diagnostic criteria, intellectual disability does not always um, cause those factors to be more pronounced. And so when you look at, at even science and the study of something like autism that should be completely objective, uh, we are finding that the latest data has shown us that there are still diagnostic disparities between uh, African-American and Latino children 
and white children who do not have an intellectual disability. And so I wanna read just a few statements. This is come straight from the DSM. Um, and it talks about the fact that, that um, the characteristics and traits of autism are not better explained by intellectual disability or global development delays. So what that suggests is in theory that, and, and I've mentioned this before in theory, uh, if that does not pronounce, if that does not cause autism to be more pronounced and more um, diagnosable, then in theory, you have black and brown children who are displaying the very same behaviors as white children, but those behaviors are being interpreted as something completely different. And I share that just to set up the foundation uh, of our discussion because uh, I still think that we are seeing exactly what Dr. King was encouraging the church to be a voice, uh, particularly the African-American church in this relationship uh, to not just racism and segregation, but to be a voice uh, in our nation, a prophetic voice to say that there's still a residue uh, of historic slavery and segregation that has caused uh, our country to live with a certain set of lenses that has produced a bias against black and brown bodies to the extent that uh, this very same behaviors that are displayed in children who should be diagnosed are being interpreted as something completely different, which continues to create further uh, gaps in their ability to get services uh, and their ability to get the things that they need so that they can advance. And so uh, as we sort of look at the history, uh, I think it's important for us to recognize um, that we didn't ask for those lenses. It's a result of um, what has happened in our nation, but we need to acknowledge that those exist and to also heed the call that Dr. King uh, preached about in 1966, can you believe that, that we still have the work of unraveling the bias that slavery and, and segregation created. And we can see that uh, more pronounced now, even in the field that we're discussing today, which is disabilities, uh, because we continue to see um, those gaps and we continue to see that lens of bias because we continue to struggle with having equity uh, and equality even in, as we try to serve our children and adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And so um, you know, as, I, as I wrap up this part of the presentation, uh, I want us to go into it knowing the history and knowing the very real challenges that we have, but also knowing uh, that Dr. King was one who stood on the front lines and recognized the importance of the role of the church in being able to help our nation unravel uh, a lot of those biases that continue to plague our community as we're trying to form a better and stronger relationship between uh, the church and the disability community. So I'll turn it over now to my colleagues uh, so we can continue this discussion. Thank you. I'm actually going to just piggyback right where you left off um, with the history. So just like Lamar was speaking about the history of Black church and using Dr. King's uh, legacy in his uh, speech, uh, this actual sermon that he used, I always tell churches when I go speak or have to work with churches, when they ask, what do we do? If I'm dealing with a Black church, I, I always say, go back to being the Black church. I say that because the Black church was the source of power. The Black church was the source of community. The Black church was the place that you either got the gossip, the news, the help. If you were hungry, you were fed through the Black church. And if you needed clothes, someone in the church can, uh, would find clothing for you. It was the hub of our community. And what we see and what I have seen um, is this move away from the church. And so people drive are, are now driving into churches. Now they're living in the suburbs, they're driving into the church and we've lost that concept of community. And what we can do at this moment in time is cre recreate that community, that koinonia community that we hear about in the New Testament. It is in the New Testament 43 times koinonia. 
It is this concept of community, of sharing, of belonging, of accepting, of fellowship. It is this wonderful concept, which can truly be a reality when one is no better than the other and the other won't go without because the one who has will share. That is how we begin to handle uh, the needs of our community. We see what is needed and we make those things happen. One thing that I always talk about when I deal with the Black church, and I'll, I'll bring this up again, is just like Lamar was talking about our history, we bring forth some of those barriers uh, that were put on us, some of those stigmatisms that were put on us. We were valued by the ability to work. We were valued by our ability to perform. Our bodies were what determined our net worth or our worth or uh, how much a slave master would pay for us. And so if we are looking at the fact that we may come in a different kind of body with different abilities, we were seen as less than. That concept of being devalued due to the master's eyes of seeing us as unable to produce has moved into our community. And this concept of not being valuable now in the community because I'm unable to produce something still exists. So how do we deal with that? We destigmatize disability. We take away the stigma behind it. We take away the shame behind it. And we open our mouths and we speak about it. For example, I've shared this story several times. Um, I have two wonderful grandmothers. Both have gone on to be with the Lord. But when my daughter was born and uh, diagnosed with many different, different abilities, um, one of them being cerebral palsy, which impacted her ability to walk, my grandmother said, don't talk about it, right? Uh, take those braces off her legs. Only let her wear those at home. You don't want people to know about it. Where my other grandmother was more accepting and loving and nurturing and didn't hide anything. So living in a parallel world of one wanting to hide and one wanting to just accept as she is, causes me to see the parallel and the different links that we go through in the Black community. We have so many people who are willing to talk about disabilities and varied abilities and all the things that uh, are coming with that. And then we have so many who are still not ready to talk. So we have to destigmatize that create an open koinonia community where we can have those conversations about what we need. It is in the Black community that we were able to fight uh, for civil rights. It was in the Black church that we started this movement. And it's in the Black church that we have to begin this movement of acceptance, this koinonia group, and accepting people for who they are, where they are. How do you do that in a practical way? Well, you provide what they need. And when I say they, that's whoever walks through the door, whether that is a child whose attention may not be able to last long through the sermon, we figure out ways to keep them engaged or give them a release. We remove all the physical barriers as well as the spiritual barriers. And what I mean about spiritual barriers are those barriers that come from sermons and from teaching and from uh, mishandling the text um, where uh, uh, someone's faith is measured, uh, their ability to be included is measured by their faith. We, we learn how to deal with the uh, healing narratives of Jesus in a way that is not damaging, but in a way that is nurturing. We learn how to handle all aspects of the church in a way that can include all, not marginalize all. Another way to do that is to begin using technology in many different ways. Just as we're doing through this conference, we're able to have the words at the bottom of the screen. So we're including people who have, um, have hearing challenges, who may just need to see it, to understand it. And that is just a given. It's not we had a specific person that we're doing this for. It is a given thing to do. It is creating that space of community. Uh, my mentor used to call it, or would have called it universal design, creating a uh, place where anyone can come and feel accepted and welcome. And I take that concept, this universal and responsive design and combine it together to create this koinonia community where we are ready for you, we are welcoming you, but we want you to move into community and into fellowship.
And you do that in many different ways. One of those ways is to make accommodations the norm, not the, um, the, um, the, um, I can't even think of the word, make it the norm and not some special thing that you need. Make it so that people know what they can have. Don't hide the headphones that may either increase sound or dampen sound. Don't hide the things away or make it seem shameful, but have it available for people to use. And in the time of technology and in the time that we live in now, showing people how to use what is available to them at home, whether that is interpretive services that they can have on their computer computers, uh, the ability to change the sound has been a, a blessing for so many people to be able to worship from the comforts of their home, to be able to worship and not be around people has been such a blessing during this season. But making sure we are reaching people where they are, accepting them just as they are, and including them in all aspects of the community. And we have to make things ready and available and be willing to talk about the differences to destigmatize things in our community. I do want us to really think about this Koinonia community, this community of belonging. We have worked so hard over the years. And when I say we, that's special educators, uh, exceptional children educators, whatever the new tag is for today, We've worked hard to remove the physical barriers. We're making sure buildings are accessible. We're making sure um, wheelchair ramps are there and there are pew cutouts for persons who are uh, using a wheelchair to sit with their families. We're doing the physical things, but are you doing the things that includes all, whether you can see their disability or not? It is thinking who is not present and what is it that we're missing to allow them to be present and fully a part of this community? Is it that I need to write my sermon ahead, ahead of time and have it placed on the website so someone can download it and begin to study it? Is it that I have bullet points available so people can take notes and, and be able to uh, review it? Is it that I have a, a very simplified version of my sermon available with key concepts uh, or pictures? There's so many ways we can include all instead of marginalize all. So again, how do you include those with different abilities in the black church, we go back to our roots. We go back to the roots where everyone belonged. And when we brought everyone to the table and we brought everyone with their abilities or different abilities, and we became one powerful community where if I didn't have food to eat, you would provide for me. And if you didn't have food to eat, I would provide for you. We become the community that God has created us to be. I'm gonna turn this over to Lachara as she wraps us up this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Penny. I tell you, it's just awesome to see how the Holy Spirit works because as Dr. Hardwick was giving us our history, Dr. Penny thread our history into like the how we do things with practical ideas and the focus and emphasis on community. And today, I, I'm also going to be building on that common thread of community. And specifically, I want to address how we impact community in this time of COVID-19. Now, as Dr. Penny said, it's important for us to think about the many different ways that we are including in, and making sure that we're providing access to individuals with disabilities, no matter what it is, or different abilities, no matter what they are. But there are a few things that I wanted to share with you. In particular, um, there's, there's a, a list that I was able to generate from the World Health Organization that provided practical considerations and recommendations for our faith communities within this context of COVID-19. Number one, for so many of our brothers and sisters, we know that um, being away from church means you're being away from people. And sometimes that, that's increasing the levels of isolation that folks are, exper are experiencing. And so one of the things that I would like to recommend, very practically speaking, is make sure that you design and develop regular check-ins, whether that's through a phone tree or it's through having um, special services 
or small faith communities, small faith groups that come together at different times, have regular check-ins and making sure that everyone is feeling as if they're still connected. Next, provide assistance to the greatest degree possible. Again, when we think about access, we might be using different technology and we're thinking, oh, well, Zoom is a great platform. Yeah, Zoom's a great platform if you know how to use it. So how are we pe helping people to learn how to use it? How are we showing folks that you don't just have to have the video on, you can also just use the call-in number or the dial-in feature. And so how are we allowing people to still get access without having to do it in the same way? How are we making sure that we provide alternative forms of communication even as we're sharing, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or Zoom or whatever it might be. Do we have the closed captioning available? Do we have the capacity to have um, the running scripture that's being read and cited right there on the screen so people can hear it and see it and, and be able to really um, experience it as well? Are we sending out potentially emails as um, Dr. Penny was saying, are we sending emails out to folks saying, hey, here's a copy of our, our Bible study notes. Please make sure you download them or just read them so you can open it up on your reader or on your device. I think it's also important for us to remember that as faith communities, we have to put worry news in perspective. Because sometimes the news that we hear is just totally overwhelming. How do we put that worry news in perspective, especially as we're looking at um, some of the negative things that we're hearing in particular about African-Americans and, and folks of color who are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? How are we putting that worry news in perspective? We need to acknowledge it, but how do we put things in perspective? Um, one area that we frequently don't talk about, but I think I, I had to lift it today is that it's important for us as faith communities to provide options if people feel they are in, in danger. As we know, because of the pandemic, there have been increases in um, child abuse, domestic violence, um, partner, intimate partner abuse. So we just want to make sure that as faith communities, we're still providing that information um, in safe ways to help people so that they know that they have an outlet. Um, Another thing that I think is really key and that I want to spend you know, the bulk of my last couple of minutes with you focusing on is that it's really important, especially in the black church, to serve as a resource of COVID-19 information. And you might say, Luchara, what do you mean by that? Well, as we lift up the fact that this is February 2nd and thanks to Carter G. Woodson, this is Black History Month. I want to share with you a little story. Dr. Kizmikia Kizzy Corbett is a research fellow and scientist at the National Institutes of Health. She happens to be a black woman from Orange County, North Carolina, who graduated with her PhD from my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. And she is an immunologist who happens to be one of the um, lead scientist who developed Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. This is important one because woohoo, it's lo it love to highlight these amazing scientists that we don't always hear about who are developing these kinds of life-saving treatments and vaccines. But this is key because she is a black woman. And a recent Pew study found that 42% of black folks have said, I don't want to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I don't trust it. 63% of Latino and 61% of white individuals who were interviewed desired to say that they want, or said that they wanted to take the vaccine. Why is this the case, you might ask? Many older generations cite the Tuskegee syphilis study, a study in which 600 black men were unknowingly, unknowingly, given syphilis, and even at a time when we knew how to treat syphilis, were allowed to have that disease ravage their bodies for over 30 years. Many, black many younger Black folks have said, um, who have grown up in health deserts, are mistrustful of a healthcare system that says, hey, 
we, we want to give you a vaccine now. We want to push something that we just discovered that we just developed in nine, month, nine months into your body. And so the role of the black church in that case is to be that of an educator. Encourage safe behaviors. You know, how do we interact? You know, the, the six feet apart, make sure you're wearing your mask. Why is COVID-19 vaccine? Why is the COVID-19 vaccine a viable option and a safe alternative? It's important to share facts, not fears. I'm sharing this because in the black church and within our, and especially within our disability community where individuals with disabilities are also more um, likely to have a negative outcome if they contract this disease or this, um, this virus, it's important for us to recognize that that's where a lot of folks get your information. That's where people find trust and find safety. And so this is where it becomes imperative for our faith communities to also be that voice. I felt that it was really important to lift this up today as a part of our discussion and I'm about to close because sometimes we don't think about the value of faith and our connection to our faith, our life, and our living. And I think that it's really important for us to recognize that our faith, our life, and our living are all intertwined and they all have such powerful ways of influencing how people look at and receive the world. And so I just encourage you and I thank everyone for your attendance because our ultimate goal is to build community. And if we cannot build community, then we have nothing. And so right now I would like to conclude my thoughts and comments and invite my colleagues to come back on and join us for this conversation. Um, Debbie. Thank you so much. All three of you um, gave us so much to think about and really pull together what we've been talking about. Um, what I'd like to do is start off with the question of if we are a support giver to a person with a disability or a provider, where do we start in helping to connect to the church of a person's preference who, who is um, black or brown, African-American or not, but who um, has um, a desire to participate in their faith community. Where do we start with their church? Whom do we speak with? Um, what are the conversations we have? Um, and then the corollary to that is, and this is coming up a lot, thank you for bringing it up, Luchara, um, we have a lot of caregivers and direct support professionals who are refusing um, the vaccine and providers are trying to find trustworthy <coughs> resources, excuse me, <coughs> to um, make available so that staff understands that this is for th their well-being and that of their families. So they're, they're related. I'll um, speak on that one. Actually, last Wednesday night, instead of teaching a normal Bible study, I invited um, a, a staff member from UNC Hospital to come and speak for Bible study. And they did an hour presentation on COVID. All the different uh, vaccines you can take, the side effects, the good, the bad, the ugly, the reason why we don't trust, and they destigmatized it. Like, I think that's just my word for today. Um, we spent, instead of time, of Bible study. We spent time talking about how to be the body of Christ and take care of our temples. And But it takes the pastor to be able to do that, right? And I, I happen to be the pastor. So you start for me, and this is what I suggest to most people, you start with leadership. Now, if you're in a mega church, I don't really know where you start, um, but uh, unless it's your youth department or whatever age affiliation group that's within that church, if there's a, if this is a young adult you're talking about, maybe the young adult minister, but you start with leadership because if leadership buys into this and leadership has a passion of belonging and community, they will make ways for those things to happen. And there's so many um, 
programs and educational programs you can bring into your faith community and educate your faith community and look at those at places that are reliable such as hospitals and health departments bring the specialist in don't try to be the specialist bring the specialist in so that they can talk and answer questions and be available for the church it's all about what dr wallace spoke about bringing that information in and being the hub of information for the black community. I would definitely agree with, uh, with Dr. Penny as a, as a senior or lead pastor myself, uh, traveling the country doing conferences for you know, accessibility and inclusion, one of the things I often run into is uh, a large number of people attend the conferences who have a passion for the just topics that we've been discussing over the last four months. Um, however, uh, one thing that has shifted my focus uh, of my ministry outside of my church has been to direct my attention towards leaders. Um, because what I found is I've run into people who have so much passion and energy and want to implement all the things that we've been talking about, but nothing happens in a church that's not important to the pastor uh, or any faith community, whatever the title of the, the leader is or, or that group of leaders. Um, and so I, I talk about in some of my workshops, um, even learning how to develop a uh, care plan um, I spent years as a hospice chaplain, and one of the tools that I learned and took away from that was whenever we had new patients come on, I had to do a spiritual care assessment. Um, and so I've developed a tool that I have uh, passed on, you know, in different literature and even in, in my new book, where we talk about how to develop a, a spiritual care assessment for the caregivers uh, and persons who are impacted by disabilities so that when we're looking to make the answer to that question, when we're looking to make that connection, we have a tool that helps us to understand what are the spiritual resources that are important to you and your family. And those are simple things, like what, what brings you encouragement? What are the things that the church should be doing and needs to do to rally around you for your spiritual care? I think many times, you know, while the, the church is a hub, uh, should be the black church historically has been a hub for education. Uh, I don't want us to also forget um, the spiritual aspect. Even Jesus, when he healed the man who was uh, paralyzed, you know, he didn't just stop with his physical healing. He cared about his spiritual development as well. And I think sometimes we do a disservice to the disability community when we make it just about their physical limitations and we don't include them in the overall mission, vision, and values and spiritual development of our church as though that part of their life is not important. So um, developing spiritual care plans and, and knowing this is how you can now help us assess what we need to be doing to help you in your spiritual development alongside of the educational piece and alongside of some of the other accommodations that we need to make. We still want to be the church and still be a voice to help you develop spiritually. I wonder if you can talk a little more about the kind of conversation that will help leaders who are either uncomfortable to go back to um, Dr. Penny's um, grandmother who was not comfortable with a disability. Um, what is the conversation that you think might help in the education of leadership, because I think um, we have we have um, a participant who's actually raised that question, and I think all of us who work and support folks with disabilities have been confronted with that. Is helping to get somebody willing to hear and listen to the need that's being raised. I don't always want to be the first one to answer, um, but um, what I would say, um, because I wasn't always the pastor at the previous church that I served um, with, I was not in leadership at all. I was an, an intern. 
And it was me being strong enough and me being courageous enough to start the conversation with the Sunday school teacher. And so um, knowing that my child has dyslexia and knowing that it's very difficult, um, again, she has a list of letters, um, very difficult for her to read. I went to the Sunday school teacher and said, how do we make these accommodations for her and met with her and sat down with her. And she said, you know, out of all these years I've been teaching Sunday school, no one's ever taken the time to teach me about their child. So she went to the pastor and, um, and then he, you know, decided to come along this journey with me. And it was a larger church, um, several thousands of members. And we implemented something very similar to Dr. Hardwick. We called it our spiritual IEP where parents, because we had actual teachers, licensed teachers in their Sunday school classes, where parents could come and talk to um, their Sunday school teachers about their children's needs. And so we began to match those needs that they and the accommodations that they had in school with the accommodations in the Sunday school classroom. It became a very um, in-depth community because what the child is receiving five days a week at school, now they have the exact same thing on Sunday morning. So if they're used to having someone read it aloud, um, we're not going to do round robin in Sunday school. We're going to read it aloud. So I think sometimes we think that church is so far removed, but it's a place of education. You're educating and feeding your soul and you're learning. Like, to, like Dr. Hardwick said, we don't want to lose the aspect of the church. We want to teach about our savior we want to teach you what you know our faith principles uh, whatever your faith principles may be and and you do that by teaching right most people don't learn scripture just on sunday morning they learn by attending bible study and sunday school and other programs but you need to for me it is best to make sure that matches because it brings a six day a week consistency for a child right and so it begins to develop and build those skills and so um, at mary's grace and at all belong uh, where i also work we do that kind of work of showing you how to match those things together and parallel that to the school just like uh, very similar to dr hardwick's uh, concept of making sure we remember with the church and and also making sure we're teaching people and let and letting them learn also, if I might add, um, yes, everything begins and ends with the pastor in terms of, of what you can do within the church. However, I would just encourage you to not be afraid to come to the pastor with your ideas. Um, one of the most successful ministry contributions I think that I made when I, I look at my engagement with my ministry here, um, when, we, when my family moved to our current location in Michigan, um, we started hosting um, disability awareness fairs, not awareness fairs, no, disability, it was a disability awareness day, but we also provided um, community resources. It was a resource fair. That's what it was. That's the right way. That's the right phrase I wanted to use. So we had these, it, it was amazing because it brought together all these different um, leaders and experts. Again, you can outsource stuff. You don't have to be the single expert. So we brought together all these different resources from across our community and we opened it up not just to our faith community but to other faith communities and so we had folks coming from all across our region because we weren't having these conversations in the church. See that's the thing a lot of times the reason we're not having a conversation is because we know one started it and you can be the one to start the conversation. So I would just encourage you to start the conversation whether it's bringing in one guest speaker or five guest speakers or, or what have you. Because one thing that I can say is some of the information that we started to share as a part of that, and it was truly guided by the Holy Spirit, the various people that we pulled together, I then maybe a year later, maybe six months later, had members of the congregation reaching out and saying, hey, um, tell me again about that person that, that I need to think about developing a trust. I, I need help with that. Or tell me about that, that person who might help my adult sibling so that I can maybe address some guardianship issues because my parents are getting older. And so sometimes you don't always see the outcomes manifesting at once, but please know that if you plant the seed it will continue to be watered. And when it is needed within your faith community, that's when you're going to see that great, um, that reward and that harvest. So I just encourage you, you can start, you can be that first person as well. 
And I'll tag team my, uh, my uh, fellow panelists. Now we can be a traveling trio um, and, and come and speak at your church. <laughs> so uh, we, we do this work and this is what I think that all three of us are so passionate about. And I think it is um, just making opportunities for people like us to come and share and talk and bring it to your pastor's attention. Sometimes they don't receive it until outside brings it in. So uh, we're, we're all for hire. So just want to put that plug out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to jump on and just, uh, and I've said this before, I'm a storyteller, so I want to tell a quick story. Uh, years ago, when I was a hospice chaplain, I talked about we had to do spiritual care assessments. And so uh, one particular, and I've met many pastors in the area that I served and formed relationships with them and partnered with them and caring for their congregants. And so I, on a particular visit, I went to visit an elderly lady. She had end-stage cancer. Um, and met with her and her husband and asked them, you know, do you have a church that you belong to? Just inquiring about spiritual resources. Uh, and when he gave me the name of the church, it was a pastor that I had become friends with. And I said, oh, you're a member of John Martin's church. Uh, and, they, and the man, he was probably close to 90, looked at me and said, young man, John Martin's a member of my church. <laughs> and I always laughed about that. Um, but I share that because there's wisdom in that. What That was his way of saying that, you know, the, the church belongs to the people. And so while I'm saying that a lot of things don't happen uh, in the faith community, that it's not important to the pastor, the church still belongs to the people. Uh, and we are, you know, as a pastor uh, and my fellow clergy, we, we are there to serve the people. And so what I would encourage, and I was also encourage is for families who are impacted by disability, who stay away from the church, to press your way. Um, many times the attention will be given when you seek the attention that is necessary and the accommodations that are necessary. I will certainly say I could not have made it to the stage that I'm at without being persistent that there's a place for me in the church and there's a place for me in ministry. And that's not to say that there weren't bumps and bruises and misunderstandings and miscommunications in some of those places I don't uh, go anymore. But um, I think it's important that people realize that there's power in the people deciding that there's a community outside of these walls that needs our support. And all you need, I was often say, get to the people who know how to get to the people. If you can't get to the pastor, who do you know who can get to the pastor? Who do you know who can get to the deacons or whoever your leadership board is and start that conversation with them so that that uh, message can flow all the way to the head of the church. But the church belongs to the people. So don't be discouraged um, if the leadership is not on board, keep pressing and making it a point that we need to become more inclusive of, of persons in our community that are impacted by disability. Yes, this has just been so helpful. And I'd like to piggyback on the notion of the spiritual care plan and the spiritual IEP and just say, uh, for families who have children with disabilities, as they move into adulthood, just like you take that IEP with you to um, be able to access um, services and supports um, as an adult. Uh, if you've got your spiritual care plan or um, spiritual IEP, you are also in a terrific position to ensure that the nature of those supports that you will be receiving are among um, the most strongly focused on what matters to you. So um, being clear about it and starting early really prepares for the life journey that all of us are on. Uh, there's so much I think that we could keep talking about. I think we are starting to reach the end of our time. Um, there are some additional Comments Can I add and one more practical? Can I add one more practical tool? Absolutely. Um, as you're reading, um, and this is something that is not often talked about because it will take resources um, eventually. One of the things that I have found to be helpful is to, as you're trying to start to encourage your church to be more inclusive of the disability community, start allocating your resources as you are giving your tithe and your offering to your church. Um, made it, let it be known that I would like this to go towards um, becoming more disability inclusive. A great example of that, I'm not the pastor of my former church, 
Um, and some will say, you know, this is, um, th it was my plan uh, because we had started a robust ministry there and God had called me on to something else, but I wanted to make sure that they continued down the path. And so we had a designated fund uh, and I made sure before I left that church and handed it over to the next pastor that that church was funded for two years, that that money was in an account designated for disability and special needs ministry, and it could only be used for that. And that's how I ensured that it became a part of the DNA of the church because they couldn't spend that money on anything else. Um, and so, you know, ways that we would do that would we we would have a if we had a special service like a Christmas Eve, we designate that at a higher offering too. So there are ways to also put your resources behind it. Uh, I, I'm a fan of what Jesus says, heart follows treasure. And so if you want your heart to be in something, put your resources in it and watch it change the culture of your community because you're now putting real resources, not just money, but time and effort behind it. And slowly but surely, it turns the church's heart towards uh, the disability community because that's where you're putting your resources. So I, I want to encourage people, if, if you want to be involved, start saying, send your $50 or whatever you send and earmark it. And guess what? The church now has to, <laughs> they have to allocate those resources to go towards uh, what you're asking them to do with it. Terrific. Two things I want to just comment on that are in our chat. Uh, one is um, an example of a young woman who uh, actually found her spiritual home in a white evangelical church. I'm assuming she is black or brown and um, it's where she has found a spiritual um, place to belong. And it looks like she's done it through her own personal um, um, initiative. And it speaks to the fact that we all need to, to um, take our agency to that place that matters to us. Um, we were asked if um, you would be willing to share a template for a spiritual care plan or IEP, which we might be able to um, put in our archive on the um, AAIDD Religion and Spirituality um, Network um, webpage. If so, um, that would be terrific. And the last comment is to um, uh, remind you that as adults, um, or as your children are uh, move into adulthood, always be sure to include members of um, your faith community in the development of the plan and of the IEP for the at a school level. Um, we have finally um, come to recognize and that including one's faith and spiritual um, journey is part of creating a meaningful life for everybody. Um, we are just about out of time. Is there one more? Yes, Ernest Krug has um, information about the um, multitude of offenses that are built into the Tuskegee experience. And, um, and it's one of many injustices bestowed on um, members of the black community um, that has contributed to the lack of trust. Um, and uh, now is a time for us to um, help to work on some of the healing that's required because people's personal health and safety is, uh, is involved and, um, and the safety of everyone else. If there's ever been an opportunity to look at the role of community, it is this pandemic where what I do affects you and what you do affects me and that gets um, amplified um, geometrically. So I want to thank you three for being just such terrific speakers. Um, we see a place for the theory of you to take this on the road um, or on the internet road. Um, you have been a joy for us to work with. You have provided us with so much meaningful information 
And um, I will, I thank you again and turn this back to Sarah. Well, thank you. As Chet brings up the PowerPoint again, I, I also wanted to thank you. This was a four part webinar series, which which took a lot of great coordination, great thoughts and discussions in the background and throughout each webinar. And we really appreciate your stories, especially I love the stories, practical ideas and everything that you've shared. So thank you so much. Now I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that um, though this is the, the closing session of our webinar series, we will have it on our website. So if you look at aaiddreligion.org. You will be able to see um, information about the Interest Network, but then also looking at the series, you'll be able to view all of the webinars again and then look at the PowerPoints. Now we did talk about a few resources today. And so I wanna share that we will add some of those resources onto the PowerPoint. So that, that will take maybe an extra day or two to get up there, but that you'll have access as well. All right, next. Now, as I said at the beginning, one of the activities that we do in our interest network is to present the Henry Nolan Award. And so this is something that I'd like you to think about. Um, the Nolan Award is bestowed upon individuals who reflect the compassion, commitment, ministry, and servanthood that values and esteems people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we'll hope you will look on our website, read more about it, and consider nominating someone who exemplifies the spirit of inclusion through their work in their faith community. So the award criteria, the instructions, the due date, everything can be found on our website. Now the Known Award is presented at the AAIDD annual meeting. Um, and this year's virtual meeting, we will have, I think we did that last year, but we will present it at our virtual meeting as well. Next. So again, thank you for joining us and participating in these discussions. Please keep in contact with us. Um, check out our website. Um, you can join us on Facebook or Twitter. And you can even sign up for, we have a, a newsletter sign up where we'll send out you know, information on future events and things like that. So that is a great way to keep connected. So on behalf of AAIDD's Religion and Spirituality Interest Network, as well as the University of Minnesota. We thank you for attending um, and please keep in touch. Thank you.